All right, welcome to a new week. So this week is all about proofs. We're gonna finish up these slides in this lecture and the next one. And these just might be my favorite set of slides because we get to like make arguments and just show that things are true that are not obvious, which is really fun when you do it for the first time. Okay, so we stopped off here just learning some terms, learning some definitions, and now let's put them to use, okay? So uh, before we get there, I would like to tell you about how to prove certain types of things. So we talked about this last time in a very co cookie cutter way with uh, things above the line and things below the line. But uh, when we're proving uh, statements that are for all quantified, you can do it in English as long as you are remembering those cookie cutter rules from the previous slides. Okay, that's the idea. So uh, to prove a statement that starts with for all, okay, to prove that that whole thing is true for all x, p of x or something, you have some options, right? Because at the end of the day, you just have to show that no matter what any element of the domain is, uh, this, this predicate is true for it. So uh, here are some ways that you could do that. The first is probably the easiest. It's called proof by exhaustion. So you just, if the domain is small, try every element of the domain and it'll all work out. Isn't that nice? So let's say like, your domain is all the numbers between like two and I don't know five or something. You want to prove p of x for all of those x's, then you can just try p of two, p of three, p of four, p of five, and check them all off, and then you've proven it for the entire domain. That's easy. Uh, so that works. And then the general way is what we knew from before. So that is uh, we pick out an arbitrary element of our domain. So like assume let's call it a is arbitrary. It's an element of our domain, a domain of the predicate that is being for all quantified over. Then we prove p of a is true. And because it was an arbitrary element that we didn't really think much of, uh, it could have been any of the elements of the domain. Okay, that's the trick. And so that gives us, that allows us to conclude for all a p of a is true. And uh, so that's nice, that's called universal generalization, that big long phrase, all right? If you would like to prove that a for all quantified statement is false to show that it wasn't true, that's actually super easy because you just want to prove the negation, uh, which involves uh, this for all turning into a there exists, right? Because uh, the negation is this. You want to prove that this is not true for all x, uh, p of x. That's equivalent, right, to there exists some x such that not p of x is true. So you just have to find one good one. You have to find one thing called a counterexample to show uh, that, oh yeah, it wasn't true for every element of the domain, and here's one. Did you catch that? That's the idea. That's what you want to do here. So, uh, yeah, just think about it this way logically. If uh, we're trying to prove this for all x, p of x, we're trying to prove it's false, which means that it's not true for everybody. There's got to be one person, at least one person, for which it's not true. For which not p of that special element is true, right? And that would be your counterexample. It ruins everything and stops you in your tracks. So, ah. Uh, Sometimes it's easier to prove a negation like that. It's only one thing you have to find, all right? Um, with that, before we get into our cool first English looking proofs, let me talk to you about proof etiquette because this will come up for the rest of your mathematical career. Um, there's gonna be a bunch of rectangles, which is fun. I like to draw them. And then there's also QED, uh, which is the equivalent of a rectangle, which we'll get to. So uh, for reasons, we like to start our proofs when we're proving something. We like to say proof in bold and then like a, a period to start it. That's like our opening uh, brace because it's a program, right? Something like that. And uh, once you're done proving something, then it's really, really a common thing. It's, it's always done. You have to brag about, you got to pat yourself on the back. You got to brag that you just completed this proof successfully and you have to drop the mic, okay? So the mathematical equivalent of a mic drop is either a rectangle at the end of the proof or uh, the rectangle stands in for a Latin phrase that is uh, abbreviated with QED. Most people use the rectangle. And QED stands for quod erat demonstrandum, which means uh, which was to be demonstrated, which is short for I just demonstrated what was to be demonstrated or I just proved exactly what I said I was going to prove above the little proof marker, okay? So that's your proof etiquette. You got to drop the mic once you're done 
uh, so that everybody can clap. Okay, so let's have our first proof. Uh, please prove the following statement using a proof by exhaustion for every integer n such that n is between 0 and 3, strictly less than 3 though, n plus 1 squared is greater than n cubed. So, uh, first thing is convert this to math and then prove it, right? Because this is, there's a for all quantified statement here. Draw the symbols and then try to prove it using a proof by exhaustion. Of course, you can't forget, let me start it for you, right? The word proof. And then uh, at the end, you're going to have your mic drop at the end, which is a little filled in rectangle. Okay, so do that. And I'll do it with you once you come back. All right, so um, here's what we want to do. Let's first convert this statement to math. What is that equivalent to? So there's a for all for every integer n such that n is between 0 and 3 like that. Only then, if that's true, then this is true. Did you see that there is implicitly an implication going on? So for all n, if n is between these numbers, then, right, n plus 1 squared is greater than n cubed. That might be the hardest thing to notice when you're starting out, that implication that's hidden there. Okay, so, but once you got that, then you're ready to prove. All right, so we say proof. Uh, it's also customary to say, uh, like to not surprise anybody as well and say like, I'm going to prove this by exhaustion. By exhaustion. That's a word you don't write very often. Uh, okay, so what do we do? We need to show the following and I'll, I'll abbreviate need to show as NTS, right? We need to show that P of zero is true. Like this is P, right? Let's pretend that this is P. P of N, let's say. Um, we need to show, or sorry, this is p of n. We need to show p of 0, p of 1, and p of 2. If we've shown all of them, then we've shown for all n between these things, p of n is true. Okay? And it's this guy. That's p of n. Okay? So if we show each of these three things, then we've proven it for all the n's in the domain that we care about here. Okay? So let's do it. So, uh, all right, p of zero is true because what? Uh, let's fill in the statement, right? Uh, okay, if zero, we plug in zero for n, so one squared, is that greater than, or sorry, one plus one squared, is that greater than one cubed? I think so. One squared equals, which equals one, that is strictly greater than uh, zero cubed, right? n is 0 in this case, then 0 cubed, which is 0. That's cool. So we just proved p of 0. That's easy math. All right, p of 1 is true because, uh, let's see, we have to fill in 1 plus 1 squared. So that's 2 squared. That's 4. Is that strictly greater than uh, 1 cubed? Yes, it sure is. That's just 1. So 4 is definitely bigger than 1. Check. And then p of 2, well, that's true because we just got to fill it all out, right? Exhaustively do this. Is 2 plus 1 squared, so that's 3 squared equals 9. Is that strictly bigger than 2 cubed, which is 8? Yeah, sure is. And so we've proven each of them. 0, 1, and 2, it all holds. We've exhaustively covered every possibility. Therefore, QED, we showed what we needed to show. Mic drop. Okay, it's okay if you didn't get that one. That's just a good first sample proof as practice. Try it again if you didn't get it, okay? So that's what they look like. It's essentially English with some symbols. But this is what all the proofs will look like in this class, essentially. The word proof and then a mic drop at the end. All right, try this one. Find a counterexample to this statement. So it's not true, right, to prove that it's false. If n is an integer and n squared is divisible by 4, then n is divisible by 4. Okay, so you have to find one good counterexample. And uh, let's together convert this to math, of course. Right? If n is an integer and n squared is divisible by 4, then n is divisible by 4. So it's thinking that it's true for every n, right? Can you read into it like that? It's trying to say for all n, 
which is false, right? That's, this, this thing is not true because we're about to find a counterexample, but what it's wanting to say is, well, for all n, if n is an integer, I'll just write n integer, and n squared is divisible by four, remember that, divisible by symbol, then, implication, n itself must have been divisible by four. And apparently this is not true, okay? So the idea is you just try a bunch of n's. Again, this is p of n. Find a bunch of n's, try them all, until you find one for which this does not work. OK? So pause the video, give it a try, and then uh, I'll show you the answer that I came up with. Dun, dun, dun. So uh, you have to find one n so that this is at least true. So n squared is div divisible by 4. And you got to go back up to the definition to see what that all means, right? Divisible by 4. Um, when x divides y, that means y equals kx for some integer k. There's a lot going on there to unpack. But we know what that means in English, or at least in our minds. So if you try one, the first one, the first smallest n for which this part is true, right, is 2. And that one actually doesn't work. n equals 2 doesn't work. That can be our counterexample. Let me show you. This part will be true, but this part will be false. So this implication is, of course, false. That's the problem. So this is the solution, and let me prove why it is. Okay, Because it's got to uphold these two facts, if this and then that. And then this was supposed to be true, but we'll show that it wasn't. right? So it's an integer. right? 2 is totally an integer. Yay. Uh, it's also, it squared is divisible by 4, right? Dun, dun, dun. Uh, n squared is divisible by 4, because n squared is 4. Uh, because 4, like, if we go back to the definition, this is divisible by 4 because 4 goes into it. Because 4 times something, which is 1, is equal to 4, right? That checks off the definition. And the 1 is our k, right? And if, if you go back and unpack that definition. So that's all true. We've upheld this part, the hypothesis. But the conclusion is false. But, oh man, oh man, n is not. We write a little slash to mean not divisible by 4. n is not divisible by 4 because, unpacking the definition, if n were divisible by 4, that would mean that, remember n is 2 right now, that would mean 2 is equal to 4 times k for some k, for some integer k. And that's not true. This is not true for any integer k. Int k. You see that? And that shows that we upheld this part of the bargain, but did not receive our $20, our conclusion. OK? Hypothesis was true, but the conclusion was false. That's one. That's the only way to make an implication false. And we found that this one is our counterexample. Does that make sense? So this is not a true statement. We have just proven it false. It's not working for every n. OK? That's a good example there. So that was a bunch of proving stuff with for all in it. Let me show you uh, proving stuff with there exists in it. And I'm very excited for the ne next Mitski album that's going to come out soon. Uh, so if you want to prove something with an, uh, that there exists in it, you just need to find one good element where uh, that conclusion is true, where that predicate is true. Right? There exists in x such that p of x is true for some x in the domain. We just got to find one of them. right? And so the, the rule looks something like uh, right, a is in the domain of the predicate p. And then we found that p of a is true, we prove that. And then therefore, we found, because a is like our example, there is somebody, right? There is some x such that p of x is true, because we found an a. Just make x a. And uh, there's two ways to do a there exists. You can either say, like, exactly here, a uh, 2 works. 2 is the answer. Therefore, I found one good element. You can show it explicitly, or you can implicitly show that some value has to work, which is weird to think about, but we'll get to examples later. Um, and that is a there exists, proving a there exists. Very easy. Uh, to disprove an existential statement, you have to do more work because that turns into a for all, right? That's the flip side of the disproving a 
for all, right? Uh, so if you want to prove that there, it's not true that there exists an x such that p of x is true, uh, well, you have to show that it's not true for all of them, right? I can't find anybody where p of x is true. So for all x, it's not the case that p of x is true. See how I'm kind of flipping that in my mind? Uh, maybe the words might help. So if there exists an x such that p of x is true is false, that means that going through every element, giving everybody a chance at being x, I still can't find somebody where p is true. Oh man, every element of the domain, every e, is false. Right? Suddenly I have to work on every element of the domain. Right? I have to prove a for all. Which sucks, but that's just the way of the world. Okay? So give this one a try. Prove the following. N1 and N2, their, their domain is integers. So there exists an N1 and there exists an, L, an N2 such that this is true. All right? And write it out all fancy, like we were doing. I guess I should have been more fancy down here. But uh, this is the fancy way, right? Don't forget the fancy way. All right, so uh, it's always proof. Which values did you pick? You just have to find good ones, right? If you want to prove that there exists, you just got to find some good ones. So, uh, well, I guess you can do like two and three. Let's be fancy. Let's do some negatives. Let's be like, let n1 equal negative two and it's still an integer. And that would make n2 have to be seven, right? Let n1 equal negative two and n2 equals seven then n1 plus n2 is equal to 5, and oh man, those are two values that make this predicate true. Uh, I have just proven when I set out to prove QED. Does that make sense? If you're trying to prove that there exists, even if you have multiple, it's just you got to give a value for this, and then the rest has to be true. Then you got to give a value for this, and then the rest has to be true. So I just had to pick two numbers. That's how you prove that. Okay? Does that make sense? All right, another one for you. Try this one. Again, the best way to learn how to prove things, to do proofs, is to give them a try. So definitely pause the video. Make sure you're doing that, all right? So, uh, all right, let's not go all out. Let's not uh, prove this one, but just tell me, state what needs to be proven, like if you were to do it all out. If you were to show that this statement below is false. So tell me, in symbols probably is the easiest way, what would you prove to disprove this? Okay, so try that. And so I think the first thing that you want to do is always convert this to math, right? Because the math never lies. English likes to lie. There's a lot of implicit things. We want to get rid of those implicit things, make them all explicit. So there exists a negative integer that is equal to its square. So we want to negate this, right? Uh, first of all, what is this? There exists a negative integer uh, I don't know, let's call it i, that is equal to its square. So there exists an i such that uh, i is equal to, but it's negative, right? Uh, I guess i is less than zero and it's equal to its square. Uh, i is equal to i squared. So that's the, the math version. And then what we're doing, right, is negating that. So we have boop and boop. And what does that become, right? Boop, boop, boop. Uh, because that's what we need to prove. We need to prove the negation of this in order to show that it's false, right? So we have to show that for all i, this bit is not true. For all i, the negation gets pushed inwards. It's not true that i is less than zero and i is equal to i squared. Because that will find our, because uh, that would have made it work. We want to find, we want to prove that none of those ways work. All right, so let's keep on pushing that negation inward. We can use De Morgan's law here for all i. Uh, so what's the negation of i is less than zero? Or let's let's think about that. So that's not true. Or it's not true that i is equal to i squared, right? And so we've pushed the negation as far inward as we can. Uh, we just need to do stuff with these symbols now. What does their negation mean? All right. So that is equivalent to for all i... Uh, i is greater than and e or equal to zero, right? Or i is not equal to i squared. And if you th read it read it long enough, the opposite of this is indeed that. You can't find a negative integer that's equal to its square means that uh, 
this is true. Okay. So either uh, if you can find one that I was bigger, right, or bigger than zero, so it wasn't negative, or all the ones that were negative, oh man, they were not equal to their square. Does that make sense? So that is the uh, what you'd have to show to show that this whole thing was false. All right. Uh, so uh, the next thing that I want to show you is how to prove an if-then statement in math, a conditional statement. I did talk about this just briefly up here. There was an implication. I kind of walked through why this proof made sense. But let me drive that point home and make it very clear why what I did here was correct. OK, let me show you how to prove a conditional statement. P implies Q, or if P, then Q. Let's make sure I'm actually recording. Yes, because these are going to be everywhere. OK, and here is why it works. I'm going to get out my trusty truth table. So I want to prove that if P is true, then Q must be true. And the strategy, the way to do this, is to assume, just assume that P itself was true, assume the hypothesis, and then prove that the conclusion must have been true. Okay? Assume P, prove Q. Assume the hypothesis, then prove the conclusion. So let me show you why that works. Why that is a valid proof strategy. P implies Q. Because you're at the end of the day, you're just trying to show that this is true. This statement is true, right? So let me show you all the ways that it could have been true and show you why this proof strategy will make it, uh, will track down the case and make sure that it was always true. Because it's true, false, true, true, right? For true, false, true, false. And this was true, true, false, false. So the only way that P implies Q could have been false was for P to be true and Q to be false. So in essence, like, you just got to prove that you're in all of any of these cases. You're just not in this one, right? Because that would be the only time P implies Q is false. So you just got to show you're not there. Show you can't be here. That's how you can prove, in English, a uh, conditional statement. It's called a direct proof when you do this. You're directly proving that conditional show. We can't be here. That's the one way to make it false. All right. And so we don't even have to care about when P is false. Does that make sense? Because when P is false, the answer is always true. The implication is always true. So the idea is. P might be true. And that's the one time that Q might be false. OK? So just assume you're in th these cases, right? Because if it was false, if P was false to begin with, you're guaranteed for it to be true. Just It's called vacuously. There's no reason to think about it anymore. Uh, but you might be here. You might be P is true, and then you're not sure what Q is, right? Because if Q is true, then you're golden. But if Q is false, then the whole statement was false. So. Uh, all you have to do is show that if P is true, assume that it's true, right? And just show that Q must have been true as well. Show that you're not here. Because that will guarantee that you're in this position and not that one. OK, does that make enough sense? That was my hand wavy proof as to why it makes sense to just assume P, because it doesn't matter. Like in either case, if P is false, you're guaranteed for the condition will be true. Assume that P is true. If so, make sure that Q is also true, right? Because if you can't make sure, you might be in this case, and that means it's false. Just make sure you're not there. And it must have been like you've covered all your bases, right? P implies Q is true itself. So that's called a direct proof. And let me show you an example of that. All right. So let's prove this statement using a direct proof. If x is an even integer, then negative 1 to the power of x is equal to positive 1. OK? So this uh, the statement is, let's go back to blue. The statement is saying, for all x, uh, if x is even, I'll say x even, uh, that implies that negative 1 to the x is equal to 1. All right. So uh, first of all, what is p and what is q, right? It's if then. So this is, this is p, right? And then this is q. Or this is p and this is q. Don't forget that because that's going to make everything come to light. All right? So that's a direct proof. That's what we're going to be doing. So let's prove it. Proof. Uh, so 
remember the trick. To prove a direct proof, to prove a conditional statement using a direct proof, we assume the hypothesis is true, and then we prove that the conclusion must have been true. All right, so proof, assume this. Assume x is an even integer. That's exactly the first line of this proof. Assume x is an even integer. And now we must show that this is true, OK? And we got to get there somehow. So this is our information. This is all the information that we have in order to show that this must be true. Let us, if you're ever getting stuck, the trick is always, usually in this chapter, to unpack the definition. We know that x is even. What does that really mean? That means there is some k for which x is equal to 2k exactly. And k is an integer as well, OK? So let's use that definition, this one right here. Hey, an integer is even when this is true. Let's unpack that. So, right, so we've just assumed x is even, so we have some things to work with. So x must be 2 times k for some integer k. Integer k, cool. Uh, all right, therefore, all right, we're trying to show this, right? Negative 1 to the power of x. But we've just shown that x must be equal to 2 times k. Ooh, we can go somewhere with that, right? Negative 1, uh, 2 times k. So that's, that's just what x is equal to. We can replace equal things with equal things. And if you remember your power rules for math, this is equal to take it squared first and then take it to the k, right? You can take it out like that, which is, if you do this inside that, simplifies to 1. One's, negative 1 squared is always 1. That's just 1 to the k. And it, 1 to the anything is 1. Oh, left side, right side. Mic drop. QED. Wasn't that cool? So we just proved, without uh, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that this is always true. If x is an even, even integer, then this is true. Take that to, uh, take negative 1 to that power of x. That is just 1, because it's an even power. And this is uh, kind of implicitly, right, proving a for all. We're assuming x is an even integer, right? So we are, this is, x is an arbitrary even integer, I guess you could say. Do you see that? So that's really cool. Uh, let's get some more practice with direct proofs. So uh, using this strategy, unpacking those definitions is going to be the answer here, too. So give this one a try. Write it out uh, what needs to happen here. All right, give a direct proof. The sum of an odd and even integer is odd. All right, so first, did you translate this to um, English? The sum of an odd and even integer is odd. So no matter what they are, as long as they're odd and even, then their sum must be odd. So I think we have some for all quantifiers at our hand. So the first number can be x, the second number can be y, and uh, well, one's odd, one's even. So let's say x is odd and y is even. Doesn't really matter. Uh, if that's true, then their sum is odd. x plus y is odd. OK, see how that's converted to math like that? And now we can prove it. We're going to use a direct proof. So we're going to assume this, prove that. OK, assume the hypothesis, prove the conclusion. So, it always starts with the word assume. Assume x and y are, uh, assume x is odd. I'll just write this with fast words, x odd and y even, I'll skip some words. Like that, okay, it's implied that they're integers. So, let us unpack these definitions. You remember the definition of even already, odd is just that plus one, right? So, unpacking those definitions, x must be equal to 2k plus 1 for some k. Integer k. Uh, also, y is even, which means y is equal to uh, 2 times not the same k, because that would be incorrect, right? An odd number doesn't always have to be this 2 times the same um, even number, right? That's not true. So it's just y equals 2 times some other number. Let's say m, right? For some 
Think about why it can't also be k, right? It wouldn't be true always. For some integer m. They don't have to be close to each other, these two numbers. Uh, but we know this is true. y is equal to 2 times something, and x is equal to 2 times something plus 1. That's what it means to be odd and even. But it's not that same something, right? They don't have to be right next to each other. Uh, so we know that's true. And what we need to show now, to show, what's our game plan? Let's come up with one. To show, we need to show that x plus y is odd. x plus y. We need to show that that is equal to, then, if this is odd, right? We have to show that it's equal to 2 times something plus 1, right? Because that's what it means to be odd. So some other number. y equals 2 times r plus 1 or something for some integer r. See how I'm unpacking those definitions there? That is the trick. So this is what we need to show given this information that we're assuming. And then we've proven our thing. So, all right, let's do this. x plus y, using what we know, because x is odd and y is even. So x plus y is equal to, let's replace x and replace uh, y. That is 2k plus 1 plus, right, uh, 2m. Cool. Uh, I think we can do something with that. We can put the 2's right next to each other. 2k plus 2m plus 1. And we can bring out a 2. 2k plus m plus 1. Ooh, ooh hoo hoo. Let's just pretend that that is r. That's our, that's our r. You see that? I found a number, some integer, that, because two integers plus each other is still an integer, I have found a number for which this is true. I just needed to find some. I did. I found my r. Just let k plus n equal r, and I have proven that this number is odd. Does that make sense? It just follows from the definitions. Therefore, x plus y is odd. And that was the conclusion that I needed to show QED. All right? Did you get that? This is great practice. Direct proofs are very, very important. All right, and it's kind of cool. You're just proving something is true for everybody. Like this is just what the universe is made out of. This is mathematical laws that we are discovering one at a time. So, all right, prove the next one using another direct proof. Try this one yourself. So for any positive real numbers, which are just any numbers, numbers with decimal places, uh, call them x and y, then x plus y is greater than or equal to the square root of x times y. So this must be true. All right, so give that one a try, convert it to math, and then use a direct proof. Assume that hypothesis, prove that conclusion. So uh, for any positive real numbers, x and y, there's for, some for alls going on, for all x, for all y, uh, what's true about them? Uh, they're positive, so that means x is greater than 0 and y is greater than 0. Uh, if that is true, then this is true x plus y is greater than or equal to the square root of x times y. All right, that's what's going on there. Uh, so yeah, just remember for a real number, that just means decimals are okay. So like 3.14 is okay, that works. So again, what's our strategy? We have uh, a direct proof, assume this, prove that. And there's also under the hood, the concept of using uh, proving a for all quantified statement, right? We're assuming that these x's and y's are arbitrary. So really the game plan is it's always from left to right. It's assume that these are arbitrary. Let's actually give myself some more room to write that. And that's usually implicit because otherwise where would where did you come up with your x and your y? You're, you're assuming that they exist. They're arbitrary usually. Uh, assume that they're arbitrary arbitrary x and y, and then uh, you assume this, this is like your p, assume, and then you prove this. Assume this, prove this. Okay, so that's the game plan. That is that what you got to? So let's do that. So assume that x and y are positive real numbers. So proof. Assume x and y are positive. So that's this part. And then we need to show, right? 
We need to show this. NTS. Need to show. X plus Y is greater than or equal to square root of XY. If I can get this, then I've proven the whole thing. So, what do we know? It's usually good to make a list. Uh, so, what do we know? I know that X is, uh, X is positive, Y is positive. That means they're greater than zero. Um, I can extrapolate from that. We've actually, uh, let's see, kind of going back to this proof, uh, I can take x and square it, right? Positive number squared, still positive, right? Still greater than zero. This is the trick. Uh, y squared, well, that's greater than zero as well. And then xy, if they're both positive, that's still greater than zero, right? Those are things that I know. So you can do stuff to positive numbers and they're still positive, right? So I know that xy is greater than zero, that's useful. Uh, so let's do that. Um, and then here's the trick to this proof. It's a hard one to figure out, but definitely pat yourself on the back if you did. Uh, once you have this, that's usually how you can bring, how you can introduce one of these guys. Because then you'll have some squares, you can take some square roots, and you have like a, a polynomial. So here's the trick. I'll make this polynomial. x squared plus xy plus y squared. That is equal, or that's just a bunch of positive numbers together, right? So that's greater than zero. And once you have that, once you have the starting point, then you have the proof. So then we can uh, make this something that can factor. We can add another xy on each side, which is the hardest part to notice. I didn't come up with this proof, don't worry. Uh, but I'm not going to ask you to do something like this on a test, but this is really cool, and it shows why this is true. So add xy to both sides, y squared. So that means we add it to this side too. That's greater than xy, right? Then we can factor this. That's just x plus y squared. That's greater than xy. And then I can take the square root of both sides. x plus y is greater than square root of xy. And uh, anything that's greater than is also greater than or equal to, right? It's just there's an or going on, right? It's either that or it's equal to. Well, obviously, if you have one, you got both. So uh, x plus y is also, therefore, greater than or equal to xy, square root of xy. And that is the proof. That was tricky, but cool, OK? If you got started, that was all I, that I really wanted you to uh, think about, right? If you got that, I'm happy. But that is uh, a fancy thing to notice, all right? And we need to do some math to, to get it. All right, one more example for you. So try this one, another direct proof, because those are going to come up so often. I'm giving you a ton of examples with them. Uh, this is definitely one that you can try yourself, all right? Average of two odd numbers is an integer. What does that mean? See if you can prove that. So, did you convert it to math first for all x, for all y? Two numbers, they could be anything for all quantified. They're odd. So x is odd and y is odd. If all that's true, then their sum is, or sorry, their sum and then divided by two. x plus y over two, that's their average, is an integer. Interesting. But that is apparently true. So let's prove it. All right, so uh, assume x is odd and y is odd, right? Let, another way of saying assume is let, let x and y be uh, odd numbers. And then unpacking the definition of oddness, right? We go back up here. So then we have this, or in math over here. So x is equal to 2k plus 1, and like y is equal to 2m plus 1 for some integers k and m. That's supposed to be a t at least, for some ints k and m. And uh, then we got to do math, right? x plus y over 2, we got to show that that's an integer. And then we've got it. So we've assumed this, now we got to prove this. So uh, x plus y over 2, hopefully, by unpacking those definitions, we will have gained something. So that's equal to 2k plus 1 
plus 2m plus 1 over 2, which is equal to 2k plus 2m plus 2 ooh, over 2, which is equal to k plus m plus 2. Hey, we did it. And we just got to show that this now is an integer, and it totally is. k plus m plus 2 is an int. I'll write it like this. k plus m plus 2 int because k is an integer, and so is m. They're both integers. And obviously 2 is as well. Uh, OK. They're integers because k and m are both integers. And then you add another integer on top of that. If you just keep adding integers, you stay in integer land. So therefore, x plus y over 2 is an integer. And that was exactly what I needed to show. Mic drop. OK? Is it getting a bit more clear, the way to do this? Is it making some, some more sense now, I hope? Uh, do yell at me if it's not. But these are direct proofs. And so before we go, I want to teach you one last way of uh, proving an implication. You prove it backwards. You remember that thing called the contrapositive? So uh, I told you that p if p then q is equivalent to if not q then not p. That is, uh, these are equivalent statements. And so you could prove either one. One might be easier than the other. These are equivalent. Equal, equivalent sign. The best that I can make that is curved. Uh, so remember that you're swapping the hypothesis and the conclusion and negating both. And they're equivalent, so you can prove either one you want. And uh, I guess I might show you. How about I show you that they're equivalent, right? Using a truth table. P, Q. P implies Q. And then I'll need not P, not Q, and not uh, Q implies not P. I'm going to show that these two columns are equal. Whee! So true, false, true, false, true, true, false, false, true, false, true, true, not P, false, false, true, true, not Q, false, true, false, true. Implication between these. I guess I should have done not Q first. Uh, I, let me do that just to make it clear when you're rereading this. Let me swap those columns. It's easier to read it off that way. So not Q, not P. So that's false, true, false, true. False, false, true, true. So the only time it's false is here, right? True implies false. And that's the only time I have that. So this one is going to be false there, but true everywhere else. True, true, and true. And what do you know? These columns are identical. And so they are equivalent. OK, so that's one way to prove it. But we can also use our equivalence rules now that we know those as well. Uh, just going from here to here, or in either direction, because they're equivalence rules. P implies Q. Well, that's equivalent to not P or Q, remember? right? That's the same. Which is equivalent to Q or not P. I'm just moving them around. Commutative law. Uh, then I can double negate Q, double negation law, not not Q, uh, or not P. And now this is in the form to bring back an uh, implication. So this is, it's not the hypothesis or the conclusion, which is not Q implies not P. So they're, they're exactly the same. And this might be easier to prove it this way sometimes. And so uh, we'll come back in the next lecture and I'll have you try that way. OK, so uh, that is contrapositive. It will be fun, and we will talk about it in the next lecture. So I will see you then.